Welcome back to this class, a part of the course I'm teaching at Reformed Theological Seminary in Charlotte on the making of the modern world or the making of modern theology, Christianity, and the Enlightenment. This is lecture number 12, entitled Trouble in the Kirk, David Hume and Lord Kames, Kirk being the, the Scottish word for the church, and in particular in the 18th century referring to the Church of Scotland, the official state church. So we're going to start by talking about David Hume, but I need to preface that by explaining what we are and are not going to look at regarding Hume. This course is part history, part theology, part philosophy, but as I explained at the beginning of this course, it's not a philosophy class per se. In fact, our philosophical focus has been mainly on moral philosophy, which was considered the capstone of an educational experience in the Atlantic world in the 18th century. It has a long and illustrious history, though you would be hard-pressed to find courses today marked moral philosophy. It was a, a kind of catch-all which covered ethics, politics, jurisprudence, law, natural theology. When, when we talk about philosophy normally, we end up talking about metaphysics or ontology or epistemology, but this class has been looking at moral philosophy and how we understand what we ought to do and how we ought to be organized as people. And this has a lot of obvious overlap with theology proper. So as we come to David Hume, I should make clear that I don't mean to give anything like an overview of Hume's philosophy. In fact, Dr. Anderson here at RTS Charlotte does a fine job in his course looking at the metaphysics and the epistemology of David Hume. In fact, I would recommend to you a book that Dr. Anderson just published last year in PNR's Great Thinkers series on David Hume, especially the first half of that book, which is a very clear, well-organized look at Hume's empiricism, naturalism, and skepticism. Those are the three big categories that Dr. Anderson looks at, empiricism, naturalism, and skepticism. What I want to do is to put Hume, and then in the second half of this lecture, Kames, who you may not have heard of, in their historical context. In particular, I want to look at how they related to and were opposed by many evangelicals in the Church of Scotland. So we want to see the intersection of philosophy, theology, and quite a bit of history. The fact that Hume was prevented from ever holding a university position in Scotland, as we'll see, unlike almost everyone we've been studying who has been, except in France, which is an outlier, but outside of there, everyone has been a pastor, uh, a bishop, a university professor, and yet those positions were never open to Hume. He certainly didn't want to be a, a bishop or a pastor, but he did seek to be a university professor, and he was prevented so in large part by outrage caused among the clergy, but not just the clergy, also by the academic establishment who thought his ideas too far beyond the pale. So certainly it says something about the strength of evangelical commitment in Scotland in the 18th century. And yet at the same time, as we'll see, the fact that the Kirk was unable to exercise any meaningful censure of Hume or any meaningful church discipline on Kames suggests that evangelicals were no longer holding the, level, the, the levers of power in the Church of Scotland. We'll come to that story at the end as we tie Hume and Kames together. So let's start a short biographical sketch of David Hume, and then we'll consider why he was thought to be a great danger to Christianity. David Hume was born in 1711, you can see, and died in 1776. By any measure, he is one of the most influential philosophers who has ever lived. In Anderson's book, he mentions a 1999 poll in the Sunday Times which voted Hume the greatest Scot of the millennium. So at the end of that millennium, they had some poll, and he was voted the greatest Scot, just edging out his close friend, Adam Smith. Anderson also mentions a 2009 survey, which asked 1,800 academic philosophers, 
which non-living philosopher they most identified with. And this says a great deal about the state of academic philosophy. By a wide margin, the professional philosophers said David Hume, followed by Aristotle and Kant. But by a wide margin, almost 2,000 academic philosophers said they most identified with Hume. He was born and died in Edinburgh, Scotland. If you've ever been to the old city in Edinburgh, you'll know that there are two statues there along the Royal Mile that people will rub for good luck. One is the nose of Greyfriars Bobby, a dog, and then the other is the toe of David Hume. So ironic that this philosopher who wanted nothing to do with uh, traditional religion and is reputed as a great skeptic that today people probably not even knowing who he is. Stop and you can see it worn out there as they rub his big toe, this giant cast statue for good luck. Hume came from a landed family of modest means. He was raised, as almost everyone was, as a traditional Scottish Presbyterian. But for reasons that aren't entirely clear to historians, he seems to have rejected Christianity from an early age. He was the second son of Joseph Home, H-O-M-E, hold that last name in your head. It will become important later in this lecture. What David changed it to Hume. It must have thought that that's how the Scots were pronouncing it and it was easier to understand how, how to pronounce it, that the home must have been more like Hume. And so he changed his name to H-U-M-E as we know it today. His father, David's father, died when he was two and Hume was raised by his mother. We're not here to play uh, armchair psychologist, but it is fascinating with so many of these characters. We just tend to think of their ideas sort of dropping like books out of the sky and uh, don't do much to consider how their choices in life were a reflection of and also shaped them and then often their, their own upbringing. So who's to know entirely how this shaped Hume, but certainly it did, growing up without a father, raised by his mother, whom he seems loved and appreciated. Hume entered the University of Edinburgh at 10 years old, young even by the standards of the 18th century, later returned to live with his family. In 1734, he came down with some sort of nervous illness, perhaps a breakdown of some kind, which forced him to leave home. He found temporary work in Bristol, but the work didn't suit him. He didn't stay there long. He moved to France. He learned French. It became a, a seminal time of reflection and thought. He then moved to London in 1737, back to Edinburgh in 1739. He would at times travel elsewhere, but Scotland was by and large his home. We don't know exactly when he jettisoned Christianity, but we know that by 1731, so you can look, he's a teenager perhaps, 20 at the most, he ventured off in a new philosophical direction at the, at the latest, probably happened earlier than this. We know in the 30s, 1730s, he was drawn to the writings of Pierre Bayle, who we looked at in an earlier part of the course, not recorded, but in the course at RTS. And Bale seems to have fueled his skepticism, though Hume explicitly disavowed the Pyrrhonism, P-Y-R-R-H-O-N-I-S-M, that Bale sympathized with. If uh, you remember that, that's the view from the ancient Greek philosopher that was a radical kind of skepticism that said the point of of philosophy is really not to come to any conclusions about anything, but to see all the different uh, variations and ways of thinking. Hume rejected that. He did think you could come to some conclusions, though he was considered by most to be a skeptic. Around 1729, he was already talking about, quote, a new scene of thought. So as a teenager, he's already putting his mind on a different trajectory than what he had been told and taught. He likely turned away from Christianity earlier than that, but this may have been when he did so in a formal way in his late teen years. His loss of religion coincided with reading John Locke and Samuel Clark. Now that may seem strange because 
both Locke and Clark were committed Christians, uh, not evangelical, we would say, but they were committed Christians and they did much to write about the reasonableness of Christianity. And so we can only conclude that in reading Locke and reading Clark, these great defenders of the reasonableness of Christianity, Hume, as a young man, teenager even, must have found their ideas to be wanting. And so he set off in a different trajectory. And as we'll see, so much of his arguments against religion are a not so veiled attack on Samuel Clark. As a younger man, Hume had confided to his neighbor, his friend, and his cousin, Henry Home. I said that word, home, last name. So Hume, and you can see Home. He was born to Joseph Home. And so Henry Home was a neighbor and cousin to David Hume and a confidant. And you'll find out a lot more about Henry Home a little bit later if you don't already know who he is. But in 1739, Hume wrote to Home, quote, my principles would produce almost a total alteration of philosophy. And you know, revolutions of this kind are not easily brought about. So 1739, he's seeing that his thinking would, would portend a massive shift in philosophy. If there is one central radical idea that pervades all of Hume's philosophy, it is his contention that most of ancient and modern philosophy was too optimistic about the claims and the power of human reason. This is very important. When we, when we hear about the Enlightenment, we think the age of reason. Everyone had this cool, cold, calculating confidence in reason. But hopefully you've seen throughout this course that that's really not the case. You have people who exalt reason. You have all of these cross currents of people who think we put entirely too much stock in reason. And Hume was one of those. Now, this contention that philosophy had been guilty of too much confidence and optimism in reason led Hume to question everything from traditional arguments for the supernatural, he famously wrote against miracles, or all rational claims for the Christian faith, which he opposed, uh, presumed ethical insights. Hume was one of the most famous for uh, delineating this confusion between is and ought. He said, we have all these philosophers looking deeply into human nature, and they're describing to us what humans are like, but even at their best, all they've told us is what is. They haven't told us what is ought. And he questioned the assumed connection between cause and effect. So famously, Hume, and this is one of the reasons he has a reputation for being a skeptic, said just because you can strike the billiard ball and see it hit another ball and you know that that's going to explode and the balls will cascade around the table, just because you see that a hundred times doesn't mean that it will happen in the hundred and first time. No, there's a probability to it, but we do not have the presumed connection between cause and effect. As we saw in an earlier lecture, these same sorts of ideas were operative in someone like Nicholas Malebranche, but Malebranche, being a devoted Catholic, said, well, the, the one who makes all the cause and effect happen moment by moment is God. And uh, Edwards would say something very similar. And so their willingness to say, oh, I'm not sure cause and effect is quite so obvious, led them to a bigger view of God, where with Hume it leads to almost no place for God. Hume's major works, and we're going to look at just two of them, include a treatise on human nature, 1739 to 1740, essays moral and political, an inquiry concerning human understanding, perhaps his most uh, 
famous work, 1748, an inquiry concerning the principles of morals, 1751, the history of England. He was uh, well known as a historian. We don't tend to think of him as a historian, but his histories were very popular and they, they carried something of his own political sensibilities. He was, by and large, conservative in his political sensibilities, though his philosophy was very non-traditional. And then several posthumous works, including an autobiography, My Own Life, published in 1777, an essay on suicide, an essay on the immortality of the soul, and then his dialogues concerning natural religion. We'll look at two or three of those in just a moment. During his life, Hume served in a variety of capacities as a secretary, a tutor, a librarian. He was the darling of the French philosophes when he returned to Paris in the beginning of the 16, uh, 1760s, except this time uh, it precipitated a famous dispute with Rousseau, which led to correspondence and to a pamphlet that Hume published. And although Hume was generally affable, genial, he had a reputation for being even-tempered, good-natured, uh, Rousseau got under his skin, which shows in their correspondence and uncharacteristically in some vituperative statements by Hume. Although he held many positions, Hume never became a university professor. So in 1745, he sought a position at the University of Edinburgh, and he was blocked there, objections from the clergy and also from the academic establishment. And then uh, in 1751, he sought a position as the logic chair at the University of Glasgow. And again, he faced opposition from clergy and from the academic establishment. And so he served in neither of these positions. He was never a university professor. Now I want to look at two works. There's so much that we could say about Hume, and I told you I'm not going to do a deep dive or even a survey of his philosophy, but I do want to look at his relationship to Christianity and to the church through two works. So first, his um, dialogues concerning natural religion. Published after his death, died 1776. Upon his death, he gave instructions uh, to Adam Smith and then to his nephew, Hume's nephew, that they were to see that this would be published. And so they got on it uh, immediately. And by 1779, his dialogues concerning natural religion were published. When Hume realized he was nearing death in 1775, he made every effort to finish this work which he had begun 25 years earlier. So this was a part of uh, his life's work, this dialogue concerning natural religion. Uh, after his death, three anti-religious pieces were published. So in addition to, to this one, I also mentioned the essay on suicide, and the essay on the immortality of the soul. Both of these in 1777. Essentially, he's saying perhaps suicide isn't really wrong and you should have the, uh, the ability to decide when you want to in your life and the immortality of the soul may not be right. So these are quite controversial opinions. 1779, the Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion comes out. Again, Hume began this work in the 1750s. In fact, all three of these uh, explicitly anti-religious works, he began in the 1750s at the height of his intellectual powers and uh, quite deliberately didn't publish them until he was gone. 
Demolishing arguments for Christianity was one of Hume's lifelong goals. One he would not be entirely forthright about until he was dead. Many Christians hoped that he would come to a deathbed conversion or that the prospect of death would lead him to recant his views, but it did nothing of the sort. He died, as far as we know, not believing in heaven, not believing in hell. In fact, he told his close friend, Adam Smith, that he only wanted to stay alive so that he could help rid the world of the superstition that is Christianity. This work, Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion, is a dialogue, uh -huh, as you would think, uh, between three men. This was, uh, seemed strange to us, but was a, a popular genre at the time that you would uh, portray your views through, and often the, the, the protagonist and the antagonist would, would have Greek names. And so we have three men discussing in these dialogues. Demia, Cleanthes, and Philo. Demia is the rigid Orthodox believer. He's a thinly veiled character for Samuel Clark. He's the one who thinks God can be proven. We can prove his existence, his attributes. He can be known by rational argument. Cleanthes is also a religious believer who insists that by observation we can show that there must be some kind of intelligent designer. And then Philo is the careless, carefree skeptic who uh, seems to give voice to Hume's arguments. The ending of the dialogues has baffled scholars because the very last word is given to a minor character, Pamphilus, and here's what he says, the, the very ending of the dialogues. I cannot but think that Philo's principles are more probable than Demia's, but that those of Cleanthes approach still nearer the truth. So just when you think Philo is really the one speaking for Hume, this fellow comes on and he says, well, Demia third place, Philo second place, Cleanthes first place. So what is going on here? Well, it could be that Pamphilus is just giving voice as a foolish bystander. And he's just sort of there for mockery and scorn. Or it could be that Hume is meaning to be ironic. Or it could be that Hume wants to hide his real views, even though he's dead, when, and he knows he'll be dead when this comes out, that he doesn't want the work immediately suppressed and people say, there it is, we always knew that Hume was an atheist. And so he has the guy come on at the end and say, well, Cleanthes who believed that there was a God, uh, he's the winner. And that this would allow the, the views to circulate and Hume's defenders could say, look, he wasn't an atheist. Uh, in the dialogues, Cleanthes is the winner. Or some people even argue that Cleanthes really did represent Hume's views. And that though he wasn't a Christian and though he did not believe in Samuel Clark's elaborate uh, rational defense of Christianity and the Christian God, that Hume did still believe that there was a design and there was a designer and there was some sort of deity. So how do we make sense of the dialogues concerning natural religion? Well, it is true that Hume never embraced atheism probably best labeled as a very skeptical deist. Or at least if he was a full-blown atheist, he kept that well hidden. Even so, I tend to think that Hume is trying to be ironic. And he's trying to provide an out for his friends to say, well, look, look, no, no, this, this doesn't encourage the view of the skeptic. Even though the most persuasive arguments, the best arguments in the book are really from Philo, from the one who seems to be giving voice to Hume. The net effect of the work certainly is to show, uh, Hume would say, uh, that the arguments of the Samuel Clarks of the world are greatly mistaken. And then, briefly, uh, a, a second work. Letter from a gentleman, 
to his friend in Edinburgh, 1745. This letter, and you can see here that it corresponds with this episode where he is pursuing a faculty position at the University of Edinburgh and is being opposed for it, that he writes this letter from a gentleman to a friend in Edinburgh to try to defend himself and show that the things that are being said about him are not true. And this letter will give us insight both into how Hume tried to defend himself, I would say rather slyly, and also the arguments that were coming against him from religious quarters. And that will lead naturally into the second half of the lecture with Lord Kames, and then to see together how the Kirk opposed both Hume and Kames. So we will look at the letter from a gentleman, and then we will transition into Lord Kames. So we've looked at Hume's dialogues concerning natural religion, and then just these last few minutes on Hume before we transition, a letter from a gentleman to his friend in Edinburgh. This is one of the few times Hume explicitly defends himself. Otherwise, he said, quote, my fixed resolution is always to leave the public to judge between my adversaries and me without making any reply. And this is one of the few times he broke his own rule and sought to defend himself. He was seeking after the recently vacated chair of ethics and pneumatic philosophy at the University of Edinburgh. And he was opposed by the clergy and many members of the academic establishment. Uh, remember how, how different this is to France. He's not facing banishment. He's not facing death. He's facing the prospect of not having academic preferment. In response to one or more pamphlets attacking him, he writes this letter to John Coutts, who is the Lord Provost at Edinburgh. And it seems that Henry Home, remember him, his neighbor, his cousin, took the letter, got it published. And the letter gives a great example of how the public saw Hume's religion. Remember, this is 1745. The dialogues, uh, the most explicitly anti-religious, aren't going to be published for another 30 plus years after Hume is dead. But already these ideas of Hume are well known. Hume summarizes in response to six charges against him. Six religious charges against him that he, he tries to respond to in this letter. One, he responds to the charge of universal skepticism. And his basic response is, I'm not one who thinks we should suspend all judgments. I just think we've put too much confidence in human reason. And after all, isn't that where theological disagreements come from? Because people are putting too much stock into reason instead of listening to revelation. Now this is, Hume is very clever. And it's very unlikely that he really wanted everyone seeking out uh, the scriptures, but this is his defense. A second charge against him is atheism. Hume again parries this charge and says, I've only opposed Dr. Clark's arguments for the existence of God. I didn't say that there might not be other arguments for the existence of God that could work. So I've never claimed to be an atheist. Three, he faces concerns that he is making errors about the existence of God. This may seem the same as the previous change about atheism, but here this has to do with a, a philosophical construct because Hume was arguing that we have no abstract or general ideas. And because of this, he's saying we, we don't have abstract or general ideas about God. And Hume's defense is, look, the Bishop of Cloyne, George Barclay, he was a, he's a pious Christian. He said the same thing. Uh, I, I'm, all I'm saying is there's no abstract idea of God that can be proven. But, of course, when we assert the existence of God, we're talking about a specific deity, so Hume says, I'm, I'm not saying there, there couldn't be a specific deity. I'm just saying this general abstract idea in the mind cannot be proven about God or other abstract general ideas. We only can think of specifics. 
Fourth, errors about God as the first cause. Errors about God as the first cause. Of course, this was one of the, the most famous arguments and one of Clark's arguments and one of uh, considered to be the best arguments for the existence of God. And Hume says, well, I didn't deny that God was the prime mover in the universe. I only said that the general theory of causation is curious. Not sure if that's genuine or not, but that was his argument. Fifth, he is charged with denying the immateriality of the soul. Remember, after he's gone, dead, he will publish a work questioning the immortality of the soul. So even here, there's questions. You don't really believe in an immaterial, immortal soul. And he replies by saying, I don't recall ever denying the immateriality of the soul. I just said that the question itself is rather pointless. And then six, he says, most seriously, I have been charged with removing the foundations for morality. He says, this is the most serious charge against me. And he says, true, I do deny that right and wrong are absolute mathematical concepts, like Clark had argued. And he says, maybe I've stated my opinion unhelpfully. But Francis Hutcheson, he doesn't believe in mathematical morality. He believes in instinct and a moral sense. And, and I believe in the same sorts of things. And so if you're going to, uh, and we all know that Francis Hutcheson held a position at the University of Glasgow. And so if you are going to be so dead set against me, why weren't you against him? Now, Hume's letter is fascinating on a number of levels. He, he concludes by saying, in effect, I'm glad I live in a country of freedom where we detest inquisitions and we value liberty. Sort of. Ta-da! I mean, you don't want to be an inquisitor, do you? You don't want to be like uh, the Catholics in other countries. You, come on, you, we believe in freedom of thought and expression. It's fascinating because the same kind of controversy has been played out a hundred times, hasn't it? We can see it in our day. Someone will push the boundaries of acceptable belief whether that circle is evangelicalism or complementarianism or reformed Christianity or Christianity itself. Someone within the tribe will push the boundaries and then there will be significant pushback. And the provocateur, if he's like Hume, will have been careful enough not to actually say the most offensive or egregious things. So if you are inclined to side with the provocateur, you will say, well, look at the, look at the, the mean heresy hunting conservatives. He or she never said X. Hume never said he was an atheist. Hume never said there couldn't, couldn't be other good arguments for the existence of God. Hume never said he denied the immateriality of the soul. And then on the other side, if you are concerned about orthodox belief within your tribe, you will say, look, everyone can see what this guy's about, what he's passionate about. We see what he doesn't dare to say, but what, that which he has everywhere made implicit. And this would be the push and pull between Hume and the church throughout his life. Well, I didn't really say it. Well, we know what you mean. Well, we should just leave him alone. Um, no, he's, he's a menace and he's leading people astray. So we'll come back to Hume, but want to change gears here to talk about one who was very much related to Hume. And that is to talk about Lord Kames. Now his name is already up here. Henry Home would 
take on the name Lord Came. So we are talking about Hume's cousin, neighbor, sometimes confidant, and friend. Obviously much less well known to us today, but nevertheless important. Henry Holm, Lord Kames, lived a very long life, 1696 to 1782. Holm was born at Eccles into relative poverty, though he was the son of minor landed gentry. He was Poor enough that he had to be educated at home under the tutelage of two Episcopalian clergymen. He came from a family with divided loyalties. Divided on the one hand between uh, Episcopalian and Jacobite sympathies. And then on the other hand between Whig and Presbyterian sympathies. Jacobites were those who wanted the restoration of the Stuart monarchy, coming from the Latin name for James. And the Whigs here with the Presbyterians, when you hear Whig, think political party, that they're not Tories, they're not Jacobites, they're not Catholics, uh, and they often, in the 18th century, Though not, there, there were Tory Presbyterians, but they went together with many of the Presbyterian sympathies in Scotland. At some point in the 1730s, whether from genuine conviction or sensing which way the wind was blowing, home came to side fully with the Whigs and the Presbyterians. And this allowed him to secure important patronage from the Duke of Argyle. It'd be fascinating to do a, a, a lecture on the Duke of Argyle because this man was responsible for uh, massive amounts of patronage. Remember how much of the, the system of law, politics, church all flowed down from these high patrons who were able to appoint people and pay for people and put people into their positions of power. And the Duke of Argyle was the most influential. Home rose through the ranks to be one of Scotland's most important jurists. So first he was an apprentice to a solicitor. Then he prepared to be a barrister. In 1723, he was admitted to the faculty of advocates. In 1741, he inherited the Kames estate and he married Agatha Drummond, who on her side had inherited her family's estate. So though he was not born into money, he came into it. In 1752, Home was appointed to the court of session which is Scotland's highest civil court. And this is when he became Lord Kames. He could take that title. In 1763, he joined the High Court of the Judiciary, which was Scotland's highest criminal court. And he held that position until he died in December 1782. So he held every important position you could have as a lawyer, as a jurist in Scotland. In addition to his legal career, Kames sat on the board of important governmental agencies. He belonged to all the important clubs and societies. He was a founding member of the Philosophical Society of Edinburgh. And he himself became a patron to many of the so-called Edinburgh literati, including Adam Smith, John Miller. He was, and this is important, for our historical consideration, he was a ruling elder in the Church of Scotland. So you have Hume, who made no pretense of Christian commitment at all, and you have his friend here, though, Lord Kames, who was not only a member in good standing of the Church of Scotland, but he was a ruling elder. Kames not only supported a generation of writers, he was an important thinker and writer in his own respect. And I want to look at just one of those works. In 1751, Kames published the first edition of his Essays Essays on the Principles of 
of morality and natural religion. The longest section, essay two, is on foundation and principles of morality, and it's Keynes's attempt to put the sentimentalism of Shaftesbury and Hutchison on firmer ground. He agreed with both that man was a social being, that he was bent toward benevolence. In fact, he says of God in the conclusion of his work, thou bendest self-love into the social direction, and thou infusest the generous principle. So, eh, not a very good Presbyterian ruling elder theologically. Keynes insisted that too little had been made, however, between the, dis uh, the distinction between benevolence and duty. So, Keynes was wanting to kind of pull the Shaftesbury Hutchinson sentimentalism a little bit more in a traditional, Christian direction, he's saying, we, we've talked a lot about the moral sense and, and your taste for appropriating and approving what is good and true and beautiful, and he certainly is a part of that sentimentalism, but Cain says, ah, we still have to talk some about duty. Sometimes taste itself may not cover, and you just have to do the right thing. The principles of morality must take into account the voice of God within our conscience, and a natural sense of obligation. Now, this was significant in its own right, this discussion of the moral sense, but it was his third essay on liberty and necessity, which particularly outraged evangelicals in the Kirk. Kames was a strict necessitarian, a strict necessitarian, meaning he believed that all events, quote, go on with unbroken order in a fixed train of cause and effects. Now, it's important to realize that these philosophical discussions about liberty and necessity don't always fall along neat lines. Someone might, might hear this and think, well, oh, Keynes was simply being a good Presbyterian. He believed in the sovereignty of God. And that may have been how Cain saw his views, come to that later, but his views were more of a, again, a, a deterministic, mechanistic view of necessity, that there is a cause and effect that happens. So, so less of a, a personal God, personally ruling over all providentially, and rather this cold necessity. And yet... Here's, here's where Cames got himself into the most trouble. He argued, we do not live as if a fixed necessity determined our steps. Instead, we have been blissfully blinded by a false sense of liberty. So he says, we don't really have liberty. Uh, sort of fate. It's deterministic. It's necessitarian. But we live life as if we have a sense of liberty. Though man in truth, Came says, is a necessary agent, having all his actions determined by fixed and immutable laws. So you see, there's the difference. Not a personal sovereign God, but fixed immutable laws. Yet that this being concealed from him, he acts with the conviction of being a free agent. Uh, in other words... Came says, we have the illusion of contingency. The world is not the way it seems. The impressions we receive do not correspond in every instance, he says, to the philosophical truth of things. And then, okay, now here's where Came's got even more controversial. He says, this, quote, artificial or, quote, deceitful feeling of liberty is owing to God's design. The deity himself has constituted each of us for our good, Came says, so we might act as if contingency were real with this delusive sense. Now, we'll come back to, in just a moment, um, Came's assertion that this feeling of liberty does not correspond to real truth, 
uh, and, and what this has to do with common sense perceptions and, and Witherspoon's response to that. But here I just want to focus on the idea that God has given us a benign delusion. Not surprisingly, many in the church strongly objected to Cain's depiction that God was a benevolent deceiver. They said, okay, this is not just idle speculation. We cannot overlook this as philosophical musing. No, this was nigh unto blasphemy. And so Cain's faced many opponents in the Kirk. The most prominent was a fiery preacher, George Anderson, who at nearly 80 years old attacked Cain's essay with a work called Estimate of the Profit and Loss of Religion Personally and Publicly Stated. Things then came to a head in 1755 and 1756 in the General Assembly as they pushed to censure Cain's. Remember, he's a ruling elder. And he's an honorary member of the assembly's commission. So he, he has a position. He has an office. This is not Hume. This is, this is someone right here who is an office holder in our church. They wanted to censure him for infidelity. On the second day of the assembly, now this is going to be really interesting for everyone who likes to get into the minutia of Presbyterian squabbles, and uh, for the rest of you, I just pity you that you don't get into the minutia of Presbyterianism. On the second day of the assembly in 1755, so we're talking about the General Assembly in Scotland in 1755, an anonymous pamphlet, usually attributed to John Bonar, appeared in which two people were lambasted. Sopho and Hume. Now, Sopho is the name that they gave to Lord Kames, perhaps because they thought he was engaged in sophistry, but they called him Sopho. And the whole assembly in this anonymous pamphlet was upbraided for, quote, deposing a minister who disowned your authority, but enrolling as a member of your courts an elder who has disowned the authority of Almighty God. Now, what's that about? Well, a little bit of history. Uh, the, the first person they're mentioning is Thomas Gillespie. This happened a few years prior. There were six ministers from a presbytery who refused to participate in a minister's installation because the people didn't want the minister. This is the, the conflict all throughout the 18th into the 19th century in Scotland is patrons telling churches, this is going to be your minister and the people not wanting that minister. So those people who believed that the church should be able to pick their own ministers were called the popular party, uh, capital P, not just that they, people like them, but they believe that the minister should be able to a popular vote. And those who oppose that, we'll come to in the Witherspoon lecture, were the moderates of the moderate party. But one man in particular of the six, Thomas Gillespie, spoke in support of his actions, refusing to install this minister that the people didn't want. And the, the General Assembly's commission was forcing to install. And Gillespie was the one person who spoke up. And so he was deposed by a vote of 52 to 4 with 102 abstentions. So most of the people said, we're not even going to touch this. But 52 voted to depose him. And he went and then he started the Relief Church, it was called. The Relief Church. So this is what Bonar in his pamphlet is saying. Look, just a few years prior, you deposed Thomas Gillespie because he wouldn't go and install the minister the people didn't want but now you're not going to do anything against an elder of the church who disowns not the authority of some commission, but the authority of God Almighty. Several days later, Hugh Blair, who is again of the moderate party and uh, the most eloquent, the most famous preachers in the Church of Scotland, he enters the fray with, with an anonymous pamphlet defending his friend on the ground that Kames was quoted out of context, 
and that freedom of inquiry should not be stifled. Then this George Anderson, this old man, responds with a front page assault on Kames in the Scots Magazine, and then another short pamphlet rebuking Blair's defense of Kames. And now this is all before the 1756 General Assembly. This has been embroiled in controversy for a year. There is finally an overture to censure and discipline Hume. So Kames has made it out. We haven't done anything with Kames. We want to censure Hume. But it does not even make it out of committee. And Anderson's complaint against Kames publishers, presented to the Presbytery of Edinburgh, because they're saying, look, this is within your boundaries in Edinburgh. You're publishing his work. Well, that fails to gain traction. And the case against Kames and Hume falls apart. Anderson then dies in December, and it marks the end of the controversy, and the moderate party has proven its powers of politics and persuasion. We will finish then by just noting a few lessons from this episode and a few ways in which Kames did have to uh, change his views or at least change his stated views in response to this opposition from the Kirk. I want to just finish by thinking a little bit about the aftermath of this failed attempt to censure or to oust Kames and to exercise any sort of rebuke to David Hume. It would be a mistake to think that the assault on Kames was inconsequential. There was a second edition published in 1758 and then a third edition published in 1779 of the principles of morality and natural religion. And by the third edition, there were substantial revisions. Came repudiated any notion that God had instilled man with a delusive sense of liberty. So Kames pulls that from the writing. In 1756, Kames wrote a pamphlet, possibly co-authored with Hugh Blair, that he later appended to the second and third editions. And the pamphlet tried to lean on the Reformed tradition for support. Kames was saying, uh, in fact, he quotes by name, Calvin, Turretin, Pictet, and Edwards. Interesting who he would pull out as sort of uh, noble Orthodox champions of traditional Calvinism, Calvin, Turretin, Pictet, and Edwards. He says, look, I'm saying the same thing. They had the same necess uh, necessitarian views. Uh, so it's an, a notable concession and an indication of the standing that these theologians have in the Church of Scotland, uh, considering that he doesn't go and grab for Enlightenment philosophers. He wants to defend himself. He goes for Reformed theologians. Now, most people think, I agree, that Kames tended to collapse the distinction between moral and physical necessity, or what we saw in Edwards and see in Witherspoon, moral and natural inability. Remember, Edwards said, there's a moral inability. I, I, my heart isn't right. There's a moral inability to do the right thing, but that doesn't mean there's a natural inability. That I'm, I'm physically coerced and compulsed. The Reformed tradition wanted to make fine distinctions between the types of necessity where Kames tended to collapse them all. So his leaning on the Reformed tradition is debatable whether he did that successfully. Edwards, for one, and all the others are dead, uh, wrote a lengthy letter later appended to his freedom of the will, a letter that he wrote to John Erskine, who's a notable popular party minister in Scotland, in which Edwards distanced himself from Kames and he charges Kames with having an entirely different and highly deficient understanding of necessity and liberty. So Edwards basically says, uh, uh, no, 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 don't claim that we're on the same team here. I don't agree with your view of liberty and necessity. Edwards' rebuttal played a significant part in Kames' 
changing his mind, or at least in restating his public opinions, whether he changed his mind or not. Uh, he certainly restated and pulled the most offensive parts of his philosophy. Keynes also dropped one of the most offensive lines from the final essay, Knowledge of the Deity. Uh, Witherspoon noted in 1756, quote, these Kames essays conclude with an address to the supreme being which contains the following words, and this is an accurate quote of Kames. What mortals term sin, thou pronounce to be only error, for moral evil vanishes in some measure from before thy more perfect sight. That was a ruling elder in the church, and you can hear that in the background of Witherspoon's uh, ecclesiastical characteristics in the Athenian Creed, where he makes fun of this view that we don't have uh, sin, we just have errors, and all of those errors of human nature in God's sight are just slight foibles and vanish away. They're just good-natured mistakes. Well, this line, which Witherspoon and, and others found offensive, Witherspoon said it was, quote, the grossest, boldest infidelity. Remember, Cain said, what mortals term sin, thou pronounce to be only error. Cain's changed to this line. Even the follies and vices of men minister to thy wise designs. Well, that's quite a bit different. So whether Kames actually had a change of heart or just to save him an ongoing headache, which I think more likely, he did soften his views on human benevolence in order to mollify his orthodox critics. This struggle with one of their own, Kames, who was explicitly one of their own, a ruling elder in the church, and with the men who were protecting Hume shows us something important about the, the overlap of theology, philosophy, and church discipline in politics. You have to remember that for those making the motion back in 1756 to censure Hume, he was the most daring of the infidel writers. And even though he did not visibly belong to a church, the fact that he never denied his baptism or formally excluded himself from the Kirk meant he was a proper subject of discipline. Okay, he doesn't claim to be a Christian. We don't think he is a Christian, but he was baptized and he's never formally renounced that membership. Therefore, in a parish system, in a state church, he is subject to discipline. That's what they were arguing, those who wanted to censure him. Those on the opposite side argued it... It won't do any good to censure Hume. His mind is already made up. Most people ignore him anyways. And a vote of censure or excommunication is only going to please him and going to help the sale of his books. So in the end, the motion to bring the overture to the floor of the assembly failed 17 to 50. So we shouldn't necessarily think that the church was just overrun with supporters of Hume. There were people in high positions shielding him, but mainly the reason it failed, people said, ah, we don't think it's worth it. The guy's not going to change his mind. We're just going to give him, he's just going to look like a martyr. It's just going to help the sales of his books. He probably is going to enjoy this. Why bother? Bonar's pamphlet put the matter squarely, however. Quote, some of you at least live in the greatest intimacy with one who represents the blessed savior as an imposter and his religion as a cunningly devised fable. May your conduct be such as fully to wipe off all these reproaches and testify to the world that you will have no society with the workers of iniquity. There was another incident at the General Assembly which likely had Kames in mind, and that was in 1757. So this has been an issue at the GA for three years. In 1757, Witherspoon joins with seven other ministers in protesting the Assembly's decision uh, 
to receive the commissions of several elders who were not properly attested. Now, the issue was that there was a 1722 statute requiring elders to, quote, be faithful in the discharge of their office, tender and circumspect in their walk, punctual in their attending on ordinances, strict in the observation of the Lord's day, and regular in keeping up worship of God in their families. And Witherspoon and these other ministers issued a dissent and said, we are not following our own rules. We have this on the books from 1722, that all of our ruling elders must be attested that they're men of God, they're keeping the Sabbath, they're walking with the Lord, they're leading their families. And uh, these elders are coming and they've not been properly attested. It wasn't that they had Cames directly in their sights, but it was situations like Cames and people like Cames that they thought we are allowing people who are elders and officers in our churches to come and sit and deliberate in the general assembly. And we're not sure that they're Christians, or at least we're not sure that they're very good Presbyterian Christians. But the unattested commissions were in fact received and Witherspoon's dissent affected nothing. So two quick final lessons just as we think, and especially in this class, most of us are Presbyterians or pursuing Presbyterian ministry. One, we must remember, it's very hard to get a large group of Christian people to do very difficult things. So on the one hand, you can sympathize that it's very hard to get a general assembly to all together to do something that's very difficult. It's hard enough to get them to do something simple, let alone something difficult. And exercising church discipline, censuring people is always going to feel unpopular. Um, you're going to have people who say, well, maybe he deserves it, but it's not going to help any. There's lots of different reasons why it can fail. It's always going to be difficult. So I do think one of the lessons here for those of us who are concerned in Presbyterian circles uh, or even in other church circles about orthodoxy, about right thinking, about right living as we should be, let us be wise. Let's not court defeat. Let's not attempt disciplinary measures that are only likely to give you losses on your side. I do think there is an element of being... Uh, wise as serpents, innocent as doves here. So we must be wise about the sort of disciplinary measures. Is, is this bound to fail? And then we just have a failure on our hands that makes us as a church look worse than having not tried anything. So that's one lesson. Here's a second lesson. And it is a rebuke to those leaders in the Church of Scotland or any such leaders in our day who seek to shelter those and know how to pull the levers of power to uh, obviate or to eliminate the concerns of rank and file members of the assembly. There's no doubt that many of the well-connected moderate men in the Church of Scotland knew Hume, they knew Cames, they were friends with them, they may not have shared Hume's views. They may have been not quite as extreme as Cames either. But they certainly were of the mindset that freedom of thought is good and liberty of expression. And we're sort of wasting our time with these heresy hunts and, and jot and tittle subscription to our confessions. We'll say more about that next week. Uh, when we really should be working on more important things, and that's mainly to help encourage people to a, a life of benevolence and sociability and virtue and, and godliness. So the second lesson is to beware of those who never muster the courage to do much of anything to turn the tide of infidelity that is coming and want to play nice at all costs and think that there are always bigger issues to deal with and so turn a blind eye to what really should have been obvious matters of theological deviance with Hume and with Cames.
And yet, as the moderates held many of the levers of power and as many in the assembly, in fact, were, were divided on how to handle the matter, it ended up that nothing much happened at all, and that did not portend good signs for the church to come.